Hello, Edmundo Treviño is an outstanding entrepreneur in the United States. Uh, we are really honored and privileged to have the opportunity to interview some of the stories that you have started to disseminate in a very special book that you have published in Spanish and in English, which is this book, Immigration mm -hmm. and Entrepreneurship in Texas, The Chronicle of an Experience, 1995-2010, which is a wonderful book. I really have enjoyed uh, reading it. I think it's one of the nicest uh, stories that I have read in the last years, written from native Mexican, which has experienced the fortunes and the misfortunes of crossing the border, and learning how to become an entrepreneur, how to help others be entrepreneurial. So thank you for being here. First of all, I'd like you to introduce yourself. Thanks for the invitation. I'm honored to share uh, my experiences. Edmundo, Edmundo Trevino Garza, two last names extremely popular in my hometown, my birth town in, in Monterrey, Mexico. It's in the Northeast uh, part of Mexico, nowadays the second largest city now, and, and growing extremely like crazy because uh, of the, the geographic situation, we're two hours out of the border, so, and, and with the incredible uh, near-shoring activities nowadays between the U.S. and Mexico, so Monterrey has been growing uh, tremendously in the last year. So first of anything, I'm a mechanical engineer with an emphasis in administration. In Mexico, it's very common to have these kind of combinations on, on some degrees. And after that, I studied a master's in uh, industrial economics, which I'm going to say, thanks God I didn't finish because mm -hmm. the, the problem was that exactly when I decided to move to the States with my wife, and my family, I had to make my final thesis to get the diploma. And I didn't have the chance because it was either we survive or I, I make this project to, to finalize a, a diploma. So after 20 years, when COVID hit, I always had this stuck in my mind. Actually, sometimes I was dreaming that I was in a school uh, and I owe uh, some courses and I didn't know anything, just the thesis. So I contacted the university and they told me, no, it's too late. It's been so long. Uh, the credits expire and stuff. But I contacted a teacher uh, from, from, from that uh, master's and, uh, and, my, and he became my favorite teacher because he was uh, always interviewing and researching about entrepreneurship and business owners and the industrial gro groups in Northern Mexico. And there are so many huge companies that uh, we always are so interested on working and, and the, the more respected companies in Northeast. So some days we have those business owners in our class talking about their experiences and that motivated me a lot. So when I contacted uh, Dr. Ceruti, he asked me if I can make a book. Uh, and, and he always told me, you should make that uh, as your final thesis which was comparing the U.S. and the Mexican entrepreneurship environment. When he mentioned that, I, I had just recently moved to the States and I was starting, I won't say a small business, a micro business in pretty much in a couple of shipping containers uh, as offices and warehouses. So when he was mentioning, what, what wouldn't you uh, tell that story? I was feeling, I saw the business and I was like, I'm not too sure that I have too much to share. But um, 20 years later, when I contacted him, I said, maybe, yes, I should share it because uh, I have so many stories. And he says, uh, we will publish your book if you write it uh, correctly. So I, 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 it took me a few months. It was my first experience writing books. But, but I said, I got to do it because several people already have already asked me, so... We did it. So I've been here in the States, in, in particular in Houston, Texas, two, maybe 23 years ago, I moved. I, I have always said that it's not a sexy business. It's a, a service garage for what we call 18 wheelers, heavy duty trucks, commercial vehicles. Uh, but from there, it uh, let me experiment many different uh, other opportunities I found between Mexican family-owned business, companies that wanted to sell products in the States, and of course, the U.S. part. 
So I started there. I found that huge opportunity and then that expanded it to a relationship with other Latin American countries like Colombia, Argentina, and Brazil. So I've been here for 22 years, several crises, uh, several recessions, several problems with our business. We made mistakes every day. So we have been very, very close to bankruptcy and we have been very close to becoming millionaires. So it, it's it's like this in, in business. So uh, I've been very fortunate and I love just sharing because I think there's a big problem with our Latin American mentality with the people that is here. I don't want to be racist with what, what I'm going to say, but I have always thought that white people help white people, black people help black people, and Latin America help the white. We don't help each other. And I think that hasn't helped uh, to to improve. There's a lot of uh, problems or, or obstacles like what I have gone through that if we share them, we can help the other one behind us and, and we are going to become a better community. So that's my idea. That's my goal to, and why I decided to just write the book. Yeah. As a professor, when we teach uh, about the history of the transformation of Mexican economy in front of the powerful neighbor, we are very much influenced, especially as students, by what the media shows. And the media usually shows stereotypes of what North Americans are, North American companies, uh, and stereotypes about what uh, Mexican people may mean in the American economy uh, in the US. So a very superficial, distant perspective, one would believe some of those stereotypes in which Mexicans have low qualified labor capacity, they do not fit in an economy that supposedly is all led by Silicon Valley sectors mm -hmm. and companies. The truth is that the economy is much more complex and it has many more opportunities than what the media shows. I'm wondering, you started your book in 1995, which is right after NAFTA and the commercial agreements, which foster a lot of new possibilities uh, potential new possibilities. So my first question is, do you really think that because NAFTA, commercial agreement between Mexico, the US and Canada uh, were established, you had opportunities that you may have not had before? Uh, or do you believe that without NAFTA, uh, your fortune would have been much worse? So what macroeconomic changes in the 1990s meant for I, Mexicans I, like yes. you? I think NAFTA helped because at least it sent us a signal that, hey, we have access to this market and that NAFTA 2.0 have helped primarily, of course, big transnational, international companies, especially in the auto industries, Chrysler, GM, all of them. But at least it sent uh, a signal to smaller companies, to family-owned businesses that, hey, there's another uh, market here that we can access now. And, and if you're successful in Mexico, you can grow into the States. And that creates a lot of challenges as well because economies are so different. But I think it opened the mentality of, hey, if you're extremely successful in Mexico, you can go to the States. You can sell sometimes to these uh, other international companies. So I think it has helped, but we haven't really taken advantage of NAFTA in, in, in our location. I think we are still behind of what we could achieve if we really have some better preparation, better education, and better way to experiment in this, in this market. In my opinion, I always translate everything to football. And I always say that uh, the U.S. is like the Champions League. Uh, everybody wants to play here. You have all the competitors of the world over here, the best competitors of the world. So you have to adapt a lot. So one of the things I have found is that many companies, they see the market and, and if they, they say, if in Mexico I sell one, in the U.S. I should multiply it by 20 because the market is so big or 20 times larger. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and, and the other thing is that they want to come and implement the same things that made them successful in Mexico 
they want to come and do it here. And the same thing. I mean, you are in the in the way of making so many mistakes if you think this way. And a lot of people think, oh, well, I just want to sell to the Mexicans in the U.S. But we are different. Once you cross the border, you think different. Even your, your consumption behavior changes because you are exposed to many other things. And with other prices... And, and the labor cost and, and all of that makes you adapt uh, to, to, to different conditions. Let's focus. Michael Porter always said that competitiveness and being competitive is not something uh, universal. It's something specific related to your capabilities in one particular sector. You're working in the transportation of services and products, right? Yeah, so we're servicing the transportation industry. Uh -huh. What's so we, exactly your business? The first business, because now I have like 10 different activities, but uh, the, the main, the core business that brought us here was to service, to offer maintenance to commercial vehicles from very simple oil change to a repair of the suspension alignment of tires and stuff like that. And then we diversify a little bit into trading truck parts, accessories that we import from Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, primarily Latin America, 99% uh, of it, a lot from Mexico. And uh, we import it and distribute it. We resell products here in Houston and then For, for ourselves, it's very important, like a geographical triangle that it's between Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio. That triangle might be worth the Mexican economy. I mean, it's, it's big, very powerful. And we also distribute some truck parts nationwide in the States. Why you import from countries that are supposed, a stereotype again, that are supposed to be more backward, less technologically innovative countries, their industry. So why a Mexican in Texas is importing components and parts from other South American and Central American countries to the US? Are there secondhand components? Are there cheaper components? Uh, what's the specificities of the business? Yeah, so when I started, the first thing I saw or, or I found was better prices. Uh, they, they were offering better uh, cost, but that was maybe one of my first mistakes. I thought that just because I, I was cheaper, I was going to be able to sell more product. Uh, in reality, at the beginning, it was because of a cost uh, advantage, but that cost, cost advantage was kind of hidden in not taken in, in consideration. I can talk about it a little bit more, but uh, the second thing is we were educated in a way that Hollywood sold us the idea that the U.S. was the best for everything. And that's impossible. I mean, just as that uh, probabilistically is impossible. So what I found is that there were many accessories that because, for example, in Mexico, in Latin America, the, the rules on, on trucking on the trucking industry are not really enforced. So you have trucks with two or three times more weight in, in the trailers than here in the States. So that abuse forced them to develop better parts. So in some components, I, I found that they had better quality or not necessarily quality because quality is something for me. So it's not something that you can really measure. I, I would say durability or capacity. Or capacity. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, and, and, and when I was bringing them here, the parts were like, I'm not working because over here, everything is so light compared with them. And then the other thing is that the condition of the roads, the, the highways, the freeways in, in Latin America is extremely bad. So you are testing the suspension of the parts of the trucks like crazy. And over here, mm -hmm. you have especially in Texas, we have perfect highways, not as not as good as Spain. I just found out that Spain has great roads compared to here, but the parts are not abused, so they last longer. So I found another way to differentiate. And the last thing is, in some cases, I think Latin Americans are very creative. And the other thing is that they're very good with the hands to make handcrafts. And when you put them on an industrial way, you can create a great production handcraft and with the unfortunate 
very low cost of labor, you can bring them to the States. And, and over here, there's no way they can compete because if, if they put the cost, they, that thing could cost five times more over here at least. So we, we found those kind of opportunities and, and, and that's why we started bringing them. Now, we are not Germany. We don't have a country that has a brand. When you say made in Mexico, you'll immediately think not necessarily it's going to be good quality. We are competing with made in America made in the U.S. Everybody wants something made in the U.S., but it's very hard to find nowadays. And the other thing is that we are not Japan, we are not Germany, a country with a good brand or a recognized brand that if you see made in Germany, you will think immediately extremely good quality. We are Mexico and, and people is like, I don't know, you have to convince them. You know, it's an extra so word. Why, why and how did you convince the North Americans to buy Mexican products? One of the one of the advantages that we had and, and we have taken advantage of it is that since we own a service garage, I can test the parts over there first before before I go to the market. We learn a lot in, in how to modify those parts and make them better or what is hurting to our customers. So when I approach a distributor, I already know all the pain points and I tell them, okay, the trucks are suffering because of this, this, and this, and with this part, I can solve it. And, and the existing parts in the market are not solving it. They can trust or believe on us easier. It still is not easy. And one of the things that I learned over the years is that even though that the part is made in Mexico, we got to Americanize the company. We have to Americanize the, even the product. I remember many years ago, I was bringing uh, some parts from China and uh, we were putting a sticker uh, on uh, all the all the parts saying, uh, God bless America. And I was not <laughs> saying they were used, they were made in the US, but I was just saying, God bless America. But uh, <laughs> but but they were from China. But uh, we we mm -hmm. now we don't bring anything from 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 there. Everything has to be, as a, as a rule in our business, everything has to be from Latin America, the most we can, uh, because we, we want to create jobs and opportunities there. The way to do it is Americanize it. So to adapt it to the market and, and also try to work with U.S. people pushing the products because they trust each other easier. I can imagine that when you arrived to the U.S., you barely uh, had a decent command of English, or or maybe you were not acquainted with the North American ways of doing things. Uh, so I, I am curious about who helped you at the very beginning, who were the other persons around you who helped you develop competencies uh, like language skills in English, but also how to learn the legal, the fiscal, the commercial, the technical ways of how things uh, were being done in the U.S. So who was your team? But not the team in a business uh, definition, but your team in a spiritual, personal meaning. I mean, who were next to you, helping you, providing you support and helping in a group uh, develop competencies? Who is your team, formal and informally speaking? Yeah, I, I had a, I had a, an advantage when I moved here that I, I I I was able to speak English. A lot of Mexicans that move here they don't they don't. But I was learning Spanish since I mean English since I was eight or seven years old, and uh, mm -hmm. and actually I got tired of learning English that I went for German classes. So when I moved. I was more fluent in German than in English. Uh, I have to get back my, my English. One of the things that I found is when we opened the business, we felt like we were doing something illegal because there's a lack of education in the business environment for immigrants. We were feeling like, oh, we are infringing the, the immigration law. And we were not. I mean, you are just opening a business. You are doing business. Nothing wrong with it. A vendor helped us to open the, the first company. We had no clue about it and uh, why he f he decided that structure and stuff like that. So we started asking the same customers, hey, where can I make my tax return? Where can I make these things? And they send us to the CPA. They send us to this lawyer and stuff. But it was not necessarily the best CPA or the best lawyer. It was the only one that we were able to find. So I think... People that help us understand better uh, were bank executives. When we started growing a little bit, uh, we, we started having 
needs for credit, but at the same time, we started talking more to some bank agents and, and they were referring us, oh, you know what? I know a good CPA. I know a good lawyer. I know a good this. We started being exposed to other companies, other, other agents. But um, again, the, the main thing was that I was not limited with my language. So it had... It didn't have to be a Hispanic, a Mexican lawyer. Now I can I can talk to a white guy. Now I can talk to different cultures. So again, a, a great advantage. So with uh, vendors, with uh, manufacturers. In my book, I, I mentioned several angels. I don't know if the percentages could be right, but uh, maybe 60, 70 percent of the people that immigrate into the States from Mexico could be people that not necessarily have education, and and could be working in farms and could be in, in, working in very hard activities. Maybe another 15, 20 are executives that they were brought with a visa to work in offices, in companies and stuff. There's just a small percentage of people that came here to open businesses. The problem is how to find them. I mean, back then, 20 years ago, it was extremely difficult. So I was just exposed to not necessarily well-educated people. But I, we started asking here and there, and we found people that were working in companies as software engineers or as uh, stuff like that. So they help us find an immigration lawyer. That That's one thing. Then as, as I started working with the manufacturers, uh, we found some sales representatives that help us understand better the market, the better understand the culture, how to sell products and stuff. So I think we, we made an impact was when we started relating ourselves to gringos, to real U.S. citizens, you know, people that has been living here all their lives. And we left our bubble of Mexicans and, and we decided to start talking to these people. And like the immigration lawyer forever, he helped me to prepare my company so can I, I can apply for a visa. Mr. Robert, the old man that he passed already, but uh, the old man that ho- sold us the property in which we have the business, he helped us a lot. I mean, and, and then sometimes people that you never expect you to help. And it was impressive how they were interested on, on helping us to grow, even though that we were not necessarily from here. I have John that he helped me develop business plans for my manufacturers so we can get distribution established in the U.S. At the beginning, I was I wanted to do it the Mexican way and it was not really helping me. So when, when I learned from them, I mean, that's when we started seeing some results. So I think it's very important to develop a network in which it's just not Spanish speaking people. You you also need to immerse into the culture. It's difficult because we have strong roots, but I think we have to balance a little bit more the network that we have. For sure, your book is about the professionalization of a, of a business. I'm interested in uh, in knowing also a bit more about the family side. Especially at the beginning, when times were tough and the difficulties, in your book, there's a strong relevance paid to the contribution of relatives, women in the family. The women, not just in your generation, your wife, but also women, your mother, aunties, that were very important, which fits a, a bit the, the stereotype of the Mexicans moving together in family. So, <laughs> you know, like the Spaniards also. But do you think that this strong influence of the family, which was so important for you in critical initial moments of your crossing the border and starting in the U.S., but later it seems that the family seems to be less visible, less relevant in your book. Would that mean that the family is more used in critical moments and when there are, comes times for expansion and growth, then you need to be much more professional. And then the family is less useful, less required. Outsiders are invited to join the company. Would that fit your case, your experience? More or less, yes. Well, first of anything, I, I think Mexican women is extremely strong. And I will say lots of time even stronger than men. My mother was extremely involved since my childhood in my father's business, uh, helping him fight with the government in terms of uh, fiscal situations and, and, and to negotiate deals with banks, uh, with loans, with credits and stuff. So she was 
somehow always involved. When we moved to the States, when I started developing products, uh, actually my mom was the one making the transport from Mexico to the U.S. You have to imagine my mother driving a big pickup with a trailer on the back full of parts crossing the border in between all the big heavy duty trucks and, and my mother there with her pickup every other week. So she was driving, I don't know, 10 hours uh, every time and it was not easy. So she helped us a lot. And at the same time, I think they push you with the support they give you so strong. They push you to, to get more out of yourself. My wife, she has put so many hours in the business. The first three or four years, I think she worked for free pretty much because we didn't have to money to pay her a salary. And she was working for free 14, 15, 16 hours a day. And, and sometimes we were working seven days to make this happen. So yes, in, in the book, I, I mentioned a lot of that uh, at the beginning. My mom is now retired, but my wife is still working and in charge of one of the businesses. So I didn't want to concentrate just on the family in the second part of the book because I have to show uh, other experiences, but that doesn't mean that they are not involved anymore. So they are, and, and they, they give us a lot of support. You mentioned the role of banks. They were like giving you advice on where to find legal advisors, maybe qualified personnel. How you organize, how much your business has grown from this small initial business? How many different business you have in which kind of sectors, products or services? How many independent businesses you have founded and organized? Right now in operations, I would say I have six and the other four, I'm always testing new ideas. I became somebody that takes so much action. Two years ago, my only New Year's resolution was to take action. Anything that I think uh, like an opportunity, I try it, I test it. If it works, fine. If not, okay, go to the next one. So I started, we, we still have, the, of course, the service garage, which is going to grow hopefully this year because uh, we are going to create a franchise and we're going to go to to actually to Monterrey and hopefully to another location here in, tax, in Texas. We have the parts business, which is split in two, the regional distribution and the national distribution. So we have two, we represent between those two companies, uh, six different organizations, one from Colombia, one from Argentina, three from Mexico, and one from Spain, actually, from Zaragoza. And then we have a little uh, trucking company. And well, the other thing is that I started exposing my stories, my experiences in social media that has grown tremendously in the last three years. I'm surprised that I have had several viral videos with millions of views. That has contacted me with so many people. And... What I decided is to open a consulting company in which we can help small businesses that want to come to the States and make business, sell products, sell services. Also, I found, I won't say a niche because it's a huge market. The Hispanics, the Latin American people that is already here established, they have particular needs as well. So when I want to share my experiences. I found a lot of needs. I'm trying to solve those needs in this consulting company. You told me that there's a, the Spanish version of your book published and now English translation. It has already been published? We have published it in Spanish, in Portuguese and in English already. So you can download it. I'll send you the link. Well, actually, you can download it from my own website at mundotravino.com. But also there's a link to the University of Nuevo León, which is the one that uh, published it. So it's, it's there already in English. And, and actually mm -hmm. has your your yeah. introduction. So, there. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy that many people can download your website. And this book is a very good reading. It makes you ask many questions. And it's incredible that you're so young. Because when I read the book, I believe that the person who had done this uh, maybe was older. Because it was like a, some wise men talking about experience. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and you're not old, <laughs> you're very wise, but you're not old, you're very young. Uh, and I think that maybe it reminds me of these theories we teach at the University of Entrepreneurship and Schumpeter, those people who had a, a vision. Do you feel that you, you fit in the theory, that your entrepreneurial attitude fits in the theory that someone who has a vision 
the image of where that person has to go, no matter uh, what difficulties, no matter with whom you will go to the end. You, you have this feeling? How would you define yourself as an entrepreneur? It's incredible because I might have that vision today and then my vision changed <laughs> to another vision, to another vision. So I have had so many goals in these years and so many dreams. But I think what will describe me more is that I like trying to get to my goals, to my dreams. A lot of people just think like, oh, this is a good idea, but it stays like an idea. I try it and I have failed 95% of the times. And I think in Latin America, one of our problems is that failure, it's a, it's a sin and it shouldn't. We should celebrate that somebody tried and uh I see over here in the States that when you apply for a job, if you say that you used to have a business and you fail, you get more interesting for, for the people who wanted to hire you. Nobody laughs at you if it doesn't work. And in Latin America, it was more like all the time, like, oh, I told you that you were not going to make it. You shouldn't try. And, and you got you to gotta stay here with us. Don't, don't move from here. And, and I have never liked that. So I, I have always tried. The, the book helped me. Uh, a lot to get a lot of weight from my shoulders, out of my shoulders, because uh, failing most of the time, it doesn't make you happy either, or or it doesn't make you to be proud of yourself, you know, because you want success, whatever that means, because success also is very relative. But uh, once you have two or three good experiences, it's like, oh, I can do something, you know. Um, and just to survive 22 years in the business, I think it means something because nowadays not all the businesses can say that, you know, uh, 19 something percent of they won't make it to three years. So being here 22 years, I think is good. So I just like trying. I just like trying, testing new things. I'm creative. I'm naive. I like uh, new things. I get bored so easy doing the same mm -hmm. all the time. So when I test, I get more experiences. And I think by doing that, I can share more with people. Okay. At the end, money is going to stay here. We're not going to take it. And I think the only thing that we could maybe take is how we help somebody to transform another life, you know? Thank you so much. Appreciate all the time that you have generously shared with you. I hope that people will read your book. It has many, many lessons of business and above all, lessons of life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paloma.